Okay, this is a kind of homage and addition to one of Seven Phoenician Seven videos. Uh, she has reposted it now under another site that she's got going also and uh, starting to put some more out. And it's fantastic. Um, think more things to come, by the way. But uh, in this video here, she does what she does also well. She takes their own words and uses it with data and information against them. And in this one, she puts it to music incredibly. I'm going to try to do a little editing over what she does. And uh, also, there's one portion that it definitely goes with the music. And this is one that I told her about a long time ago. I didn't get a response to. And here it is again. So we want to show that, though. But uh, this is uh, some black guy trying to debunk or discredit if he can the new genetic data that's been found that they did over well they got the genetic data for over 90 mummies and uh, three of them they got the entire genetics of in other words they could really pretty much clone these people now but the other ones they got all the genetic data out of and blacks want to come across as well they only got three so whatever and that's and they try to discount it and say well that was after the Hyksos so these are the Hyksos and it aren't the Egyptians because the Egyptians somehow were Negroids that looked like him from sub-Saharan far west Africa I know it's disgusting and you have to make a lot of leaps the best that they can come up with is that maybe Nubians or some Negroids that were there were part of it but they still didn't know it existed and it exposes itself very easily that way. But let's get into this. They had ties to Near Eastern populations the, in the Levant and European, and European, and European, and European. And that these mummies who had near, uh, who had Middle Eastern um, genome or genetic information and who had genetic information that tied them into the point and European. That, that these mummies who had near, uh, who had Middle Eastern um, genome or genetic information and who had genetic information that tied them into the point. They had, they had ties, they had ties to near Eastern populations the, in the Levant and European. And European. And European. That these mummies who had near, uh, who had Middle Eastern um, genome or genetic information and who had genetic information that tied them into the point. The test says that they are closely related to Middle Easterners. They're closely related to individuals in Levant, Levant Turkey, in Europe. The DNA test uh, did show that whoever these mummies represent were more closely related to individuals outside of Africa than individuals from sub-Saharan Africa. Amazing, isn't it? Well, just anybody but sub-Saharan Africans. That's pretty much what it dictates. Although they said that there were some that actually showed a small scattering that might have been showings of admix. That they group with genetics, craniometry, hair, everything that goes with it, of course, from pre-dynastic all the way through with early Caucasians. Some of them even blonde, redhead, and if you look up blue-eyed Egyptians, which we will do here shortly, you can see these crystal blue-eyed statues they begin with. And so there is no beginning that got melded out later. And what they were hoping to find in this test, by the way, was the changing of the guard and some genetic flip-flopping going on for they would see Egyptians, then some Egyptians admixed probably with Persians, and then some Akkadian maybe, but then definitely some Greek integration and then Romans. And the amazing thing is they saw continuity and these Egyptians did not have any integration pretty much whatsoever. And the Negroid 
integration that they see in the population today shows up much later and they only have a 1% correlation to the ancient Egyptians. But the people that do were people out of the Levant, Anatolia in ancient times and early European hunter-gatherers, which we will get into again. When you look into the site Abu Sir El Malek, among other things, it is known to be a burial site that was used by the Hyksos. No, it's not. It's uh, more centralized, and it was known to have been used all the way through the dynasties. In fact, that's the reason that they love their opportunity to check it here, because this would have been a mixing in enough of the south as far as the north. It's not just looking at some delta thing, but it would have been definitely the crossing point of it. And a lot of people wanted to be buried here due to the ancients buried here and so on. And so it has continuity and it also has connections and connections that the Egyptians themselves would have made and wanted to be buried against. And uh, it reveals quite startling information for some, but not for others. For others, it's just another verification. So let's look at this info that showed up here. Now he says that these mummies are invading Hyksos, Europeans, and a minute he's going to even physically say this and say it is what it is or whatever, because that they date from the New Kingdom Roman era is what they try to pull off here. Well, what's the reality in that? Well, some of them don't. And they definitely don't want to discount that. They try to throw that and lob it in with that. Well, they only got three and those don't. Oh, oh well, what about the other ones that also have the exact same genetics, but some that do? And we're just going to look at some matching genetics here. <laughs> So, uh, back in the 12th dynasty, pre-Hyksos, there is this one that has M1A1, and I'll be damned if all these don't have this same genetic connections to it. And it shows you that, look at this date, 1200 BC, earlier and later. Same genetics. Now this is M. In a moment we're going to look at some U. And that has to do with European undergathers, but looky here. Same. How can they be invaders? When they have the exact same appetite. The test said that they are closely related to Middle Easterners, Middle Easterners, Middle Easterners. Since Abu Sir is closely related to the Middle Easterners, and since mummies from the 12th dynasty are the exact same appetite as those Middle Easterners, is it therefore proves that Abu Sir reflects a genetic continuum with the 12th dynasty? of Dare Ifra, Rifa populations. Free hike sos Egyptians are always deemed as original founders descended from the Levant during the Neolithic time. But who were those people that descended from that? Well, we're finding the genetics actually and the people make an easy connection. These people of Cattle Hoyuk and apparently of Gobekli Tepe, brought cattle and grains along with the Sumerian people into this area. Grains and cattle that had been domesticated by both of these people long before they give credit for, and the genetics proves it, down and into Egypt. But the Natufians are shown as being around the crutch of what we would call Canaanite area, Palestine, if you will, ancient Phoenicians, 
around the crescent that is the eastern and southeastern shore of the delta and all they literally did was walk up north and get together with the population that was there later and it's believed that the sphinx may have been actually deviated long before the pyramids were built there too but other people have a lot of other thoughts about it but one thing's for sure the Egyptians were Caucasians as neither Abu Sir nor Der Arifa possess stepped like ancestry this is evidence that both Abu Sir and Del Rifa descend from Levantines who migrated into Egypt during the Neolithic who are a mix of early European hunter-gatherers Proto-European farmers and Anatolian farmers and hunter-gatherers and the elder genetics matches with them in these areas we'll look at that shortly too she puts it through rather fast some of these you have to stop the video on I hate that because the music's going hot but then again I'll get flagged I don't know how she doesn't get flagged he doesn't want to deal with the uh, European connection it it is what it is he says it is what it is what it is it's what it is what it is oh is it so here's where she gets to shine and show that genetics takes over and these are moments like in my videos huh uh, David Reich is in on this too famous geneticist theorist on genetics but um, this is like in my videos where I'll show somebody who is well known and well established and their information is part of my information and then they somehow try to come after me as if I don't know anything and that they're all so smart now and that if they could discredit me that makes all these guys wrong and so you can see the logic failure at the point of that attempt goes before what she shows and what I show are quite often blended knowledge along with genetic and other archaeological data proving our point and showing not the lie now it is what it is he says and so here's a 4,000 year old so 2000 BC so we've got within his time frame oops an early Middle Kingdom governor named Jehudi Nat, which I think that means Thoth is strong or powerful Thoth is the god of wisdom and there are many things I could say that he said about vile Nubian troglodytes. But um, there were nomarchs, like monarchs, of the Hare Nome. And so these were governance over areas. There were times there were viceroys over Nubia. They became known as the Kushites. And in the 25th dynasty, they retook back over Egypt while using apparently some Nubians but people want to misconstrue that also let's continue I'm sorry I caught it right before I flipped or it flipped right here but right in there on that last one it says that it says uh, thought is strong or thought is mighty so um, yeah 
Now, given the available data, U5 is the dominant mitochondrial haplogroup found among hunter-gatherers in Europe, early Europe. The recovery of haplogroup U5B, 2B5, a variation on a theme, early Caucasian hunter-gatherers, sequenced from the mummy of Jihadnuk, aha, uh -huh. It was observed the U5 lineage could potentially reflect interactions between Egypt and the Near East to date as far back as pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods. This seems to be their way of saying that, um, yeah, there were uh, Europeans here in pre-dynastic Egypt. In Egypt. Yeah. And... Perhaps it was due to trade, or they came on down now and helped to form Egypt. And now this is the part I love about this video and what she's able to do. Somehow, through the process of showing this information, she lines it right up to where the drum intro back in correlates and shows all of their genetics and how they connect up together. And how many of these mummies are also found with this early European haplogroup U5. <laughs> And, man, that's powerful. That's almost like cutting off the Led Zeppelin cashmere right when it comes back into it. But, yeah, 4,000 year old. Jehudi knocked. Jehudi again is Thoth. Jehudi. The observed U5 lineage could be potential or reflect interactions between Egypt and Near East State as far back as the pre dynastic and early dynastic periods. For we find the genetics all the way back there and then. These cranium and everything matches, and they got blonde hair into them, and ginger, the mummy that's pre dynastic, you know, so that just makes perfect sense here. And if we look at the extent, man, it's weird, but it's just all of North Africa and all this area that you would have called ancient Phoenician lands and all the Caucasians of North Africa up into Egypt but also where is it at now well man there's some in Anatolia some bit going around through Greece it shows all the way up through Russia and gets real strong in the Scandinavian lands and stuff but it's also pretty strong all across Egypt and has a dark area here on the edge of France yeah mmm and Sardinians are quite strong with it and still extant out on the boot here too and that strange land of proto-Europeans that there are little blotches there on showing things like X haplogroup and other ones that are showing up in special little areas and here we have it again <laughs> And now we're looking at genetics that they have found over skeletons and such, well, literally of skeletons, going back well over 18,000 years before present or 16,000 BC. Here they do not use BC at all, because you're scientists. These before present or KYA or thousand years before now. Before present is locking it usually in less than a thousand years. In other words, they're saying, oh, 13,090 and so on. And where do we find that U at? Well, 12,000 BC, we find it in France. Rochdane and Abu Ser found it. Paglisi in Italy in 18,000. To 19,000 years before present, 17,000 BC. Filabrona found it in Italy, 12,000. 
years ago, but also in Croatia, 5800 and 8100 BC, the history of Southern Europe, Ice Age Europe, nature, mitochondrial genomes, right? Suggesting dispersals. Serbia, 7306,000. Ukraine in 55,400. Germany, 9,000 years ago. Even England at a closer to modern day. And Spain even too. And now we see a connection to ancient Egyptian and ancient Egyptian mummies and where these type of people live that contain this haplogroup today. And uh, this is just a small snippet out of Krauss, who's the famous geneticist behind this, talking about the first genome data from mummies, finds broken link to modern nation and its inhabitants. Were Egypt's ancient pharaohs European? But it certainly changes the way we think about ancient Egyptians being absolutely very closely related to the Near East. Because they're not really kind of related to that. They're related to the ancient Near East, like Sumerians and people of Levant and up through Anatolia. But those people's DNA now shows to be much up here. They're those fair-skinned Caucasians. You know the art that they show, of course, a tanned man or red ochre and a pale woman. And that's shown in Greek art and Etruscan, Matani, Minoans, all these people around here. One thing that they did correctly show is Negroids and the only Negroids in the area. And again, West African primitives didn't even know Egypt existed. So it's sad just for even the attempt to be made. And when it exposes itself, it looks even more pathetic. So genetically, they're a Near Eastern population. They're not an African population. If you define African as Sub-Saharan Africa, in other words, if you're saying Negroid, no. Wolfgang Hawk, a group leader at the Max Planck Institute and a guy that I've got a uh, video on that really is just an, an interview, a radio interview with him. And he tells you about King Tut's DNA also. And he also says that it's related to um, Tsar Nicholas of Russia and many more famous people. Uh, the genetics of the Abu Ser el Melek community did not undergo any major shifts during the 1300 year time span we studied, suggesting that the population remained genetically relatively unaffected by foreign conquest and rule. Now, the thing is, is that's what they were looking for, people. That's what they were expecting to find. For they've got some of these other people's genetics somewhat in test. And then they go, okay, well, here's where the Persians come in. And only these people have it. And where does it affect? And where does it not affect? And all these things. And it was kind of disappointing in many ways on the fact that, no, no. Uh, they don't see any integration flipping around and twisting. What it did expose is that their early Proto-Indo-European hunter-gatherers, Anatolian farmers, and they're related to Middle Eastern people and ancient Middle Eastern people, and not Negroids. Now this is a. Uh, part of another study that shows sub-Saharan DNA shows up later much later right and in this one it says the data from our three successful genotype samples this is the full genetics do not suggest a foreign origin so can be considered representing the local community profile of the time but not of the current Caucasian Egyptian population, they only have a 1% connection. Now, the music is probably getting annoying whenever it cuts in like that, but the observed U5 lineage could be potentially reflect interactions between Egypt and Near East and date as far back as 
pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods. But they would have to have the genetics back from before that and really see the truth of that. But in reality, they talk about how interesting it was, even in here, MDTA sequence similar to Jehut de Nacht, right? And it coincidentally it was matching up to some people in Lebanon. Well, Laban of the Bible is what that's kind of named after, and Anatolia is named after a knot. Uh huh. And that's a ancient Canaanite goddess. The Phoenicians called themselves Canaan. And uh, so what we have here is early Caucasians. Now, Laban in the Bible is known to actually mean white. Laban means white. And so whenever Jacob is said to be the same in him and everything and flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, it all goes together with these early Caucasians that heralded mankind in North African, Egyptian, biblical, Greek, Roman, European. samples from individuals who were there in let's say 2700 BCE or even 1900 BCE you know the actual founders of the civilization oops too late so what we have here is a picture of Jehudi Nacht and while you have seen some more red ochre, oh my gosh, they're all Caucasian phenotypes, and there he is, 12th Dynasty, and that hookup. But then the other genetics you were looking at earlier, and what he looks like. And then they show the only Negroids around, and they aren't even allowed into Egypt. During the Ramsey Dynasty, and he's in the tomb showing that they are paying homage, but, uh, they have steles which say they don't even come into Egypt. They pay homage at uh, Iken, past Heth, way up after they had pushed back into Nubia again and then subjugated them up under viceroys and governors that became Kushites. <laughs> Ancient Egyptians closely resemble ancient and modern Near Eastern populations, especially those in the Levant. Yep, it does. And interestingly, you see this blue eye here of seven Phoenician seven rotating in like it gloriously does at the end of all these videos. Well, let's let's take a look at something that we can correlate to that. Blue-eyed Egyptians. So he's talking about the earliest of dynasties, but what we're looking at here is the earliest of dynasties. For this one here, which we're going to look at closer, is the second pharaoh ever. That's Horaha. But as we look closer at them, they have these crystal blue eyes that they've made, which is an incredible upart that they were to make crystal lenses like this and put them on these statues. Now, some of these are scribes and they have them, but they are all well known. Crystal blue eyes, they follow you around the room. At certain angles, they turn gray, and at certain angles, they turn blue. Horaha, second pharaoh ever. And the famous Nefertiti. And while one eye is missing, the other one is still blue. Right there. And Mitri and other scribes. That same scribe there. They have red-headed ones too. And uh, there's the rendition remake of King Tut. And even Nakata statues of the earliest dynasties of these blue eyes. Oh, there, there's Horaha. Turn it an angle. This one's kind of blue. That one's turned gray. Really kind of grayish blue and all. But even the earliest of statues. Here you can look into the eyes of an early Caucasian Egyptian. These are 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, all the way through the 12th dynasties. Yep, Ka'apa right here, blue eyes. 
amazing the woman here with blue eyes and how pale she is and this is of the earliest of dynasties back when they were drawing or statuary making that was more realistic and not so an exacting type yet right But you can also make connections between this wing sun disc people. For that shown in, oh, northern India, Sumerians, which are shown here in their blue-eyed statues. And see the Sumerian priest king that's right here? In the Louvre, they have a statue of Narmer. And it is this statuary that has had its arms broken off, but it still has the glob where its hands are attached to the chest. It still has a remnant of one blue eye in him, and he's the statue of Narmer, the first unifier of Egypt. And uh, while they like to show this other head and even expand it and do things and even try to show it looks like Mike Tyson's strange, crazy ideas blacks try to come up with to try to implicate that West African primitives somehow were the Caucasian Egyptians, it falls flat on its face whenever you know the truth and reality of it all and uh, it goes on and on and on and there are others that show this blue-eyed effect in fact the blue eye Egypt symbol that's the eye of Horus Wajet Wajet means blue it is the blue eye of Horus there are tomb which state this clearly such as I knit upon the head of the blue-eyed Horus, the one who acts, or the god who acts. And you can see this also in Moche statues in South America, bearded gods and so and so they had, Buddha himself, but uh, one thing's for sure, they uh, don't have Negroid Egyptians, that doesn't exist. The Chinese are much more closely related than any Negroid would have been. And so that explains it pretty much there. And uh, King Tut's relatives, it says right here, King Tut's relatives and blue-eyed people and the genetics that goes along with it and this spread of early Proto-Indo-Europeans and down. And see, this is much later for this wave had already happened long before and the Gentufians and so on and heralded mankind down into Egypt and Sumeria even before this date. Yeah. So anyhow, guys, really like Seven Phoenician Seven's video on that. I love the way she tracks the drum intro right into it, showing the data. But uh, yeah, many of the uh, mummies are showing a uh, European haplogroup others are showing still Caucasian haplogroups from Anatolia and places like Georgia which are right in the Caucasus Mountains area and pretty much close to that Noah place that the boat landed and so on and boy doesn't this show it too and wow funny how that all goes together and the one thing that's really not part of any of it are these sub-Saharan West African primitives that are trying to claim anything except for being sub-Saharan West African primitives. Like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy. We'll get on to more. I hope she continues to upload her entire category or library, but uh, I think we're well on the way. Peace.